Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's The Weekly Sip. And in fact, during the uh, the premiere yesterday, there was a whole bunch of people saying, where's the sip? Where's the sip? Well, here it is. Mmm. You even got a, uh, a bonus gulp in there. How'd you like that? And it is a very good morning indeed. How many of you guys are on the SFO Discord? Because if you were, I did a, uh, a morning wake-up call, 5 a.m., everyone. And hopefully your phone did not wake you with notifications. Time to get up, guys. It, uh, it seems that not too many people uh, appreciated it. <laughs> Speaking of premieres, I'm only really using them for long-form videos like, uh, like yesterday's Don't Have Kids video. All my short videos and the weekly sips and dumping with scrump and anything else that I decide to do will probably not see a premiere. Only the big ones will see one. And I gotta say, yesterday's video was uh, quite divisive as it's still playing out in the comment section, all the uh, all the arguments. That's good, though. That's good. There's a bunch of people who agree with my analysis. There's a bunch of people who think that I am just a fucking cuck. And, you know, that's fine. <laughs> but the best part about it is that we're talking about the subject. We're talking about whether or not to have kids. We're actually talking about the contents of the Christchurch Shooters Manifesto. We're not simply shutting off our brains and taking in the media narrative wholesale. It's more important that we discuss and disagree because the radical lefties in the media simply want us to shut off our brains and assume that it's all racist. So keep talking, guys. Here's an article that I meant to actually put in yesterday's video, but I just couldn't find a way to, uh, to worm it in. Thousands of dads are left in shock as do-it-yourself paternity tests soar. Oh, maybe there is something to the fact that everyone's fucking cheating nowadays. Up to 30,000 tests are being performed every year. The DNA test can be carried out with a simple cheek swab. 20% of men will learn they are not the father of the child they're testing. One in five sales of secret paternity tests are surging, according to suppliers of do-it-yourself home kits. The DNA tests, which can be carried out with simple cheek swabs, are leading to growing numbers of men discovering they are not the biological father of children they have been led to believe were theirs. So, guys, how long until this is made illegal? Think about it for a minute. On the argument that it's causing more and more men to disassociate from their families, drop their responsibilities to these kids and their mothers, break up marriages, rather than actually blame the woman who cheated on the man, how long until the people in power make some sort of a claim that children have the exclusive right to their genetic material and that you can't steal it from them to do a, a test like this? 20% of men will learn they're not the father. In some regions, the figure is higher, including the Northeast, where it's 30%. Holy fuck, can you imagine? That's almost one in three. Holy shit. The explosion in demand for the test have been fueled by the ease with which definitive DNA paternity results can now be obtained. For about £99, testing kits which promise 100% accurate next-day results can be bought online. Yeah, I think the era of mom's baby, dad's maybe is, uh, is rapidly coming to an end. To be honest, I think that a paternity test should probably be mandatory at birth. It's a trust-but-verify situation. I know the arguments against, against not having the government involved, but if it is, say, a legal statute that all kids have to be paternity tested at birth... It removes the uh, the awkwardness of it, you know? Because let's say you're in a relationship and you have a suspicion that your girl might have been having kids with somebody else and you're the sucker. But you have no proof. You just have, like, a feeling. And then you ask, oh, hey, can we get this kid uh, paternity tested? They're going to instantly take that as an affront. And, you know, if they're innocent, why wouldn't they? From the point of view of the girl, if you're innocent, if you have been faithful and your guy comes to you and asks for a paternity test, that is a slap in the face. There's no easy way to do this. So if it becomes mandated, then it becomes a lot easier to do. Of course, I don't think the government will ever actually mandate something like that because it goes against their interests. Their interests are to keep family units complete, are to keep men working, and if necessary, to keep child support payments flowing. And if mandatory paternity testing disrupts that, a government is not going to implement it. As long as the man is named on the child's birth certificate or has parental responsibility, no permission is required from either the mother or child, meaning the test can be car carried out in total secrecy. That's going to change, too. There's going to be a legal statute for that. They're going to be like, no, it's, it's the mother's child, so the mother has the say. 
In some U.S. states, concern over this has led to a recent ban on do-it-yourself home DNA testing, with all tests now having to be ordered by a doctor or court official and conducted under their supervision. In Britain, there is no such legislation currently to be considered. Yeah, see, I didn't even read ahead in the article. I already knew where they were going with it, and that's where they went. And, of course, whenever this topic comes up, I am always reminded of this old article from 2010. Who's the daddy? Paternity can now be verified by a simple test, but it doesn't mean it should be. It's a wise child, they say, that knows its own father. Nowadays, wisdom is hardly required. DNA tests can do the job with scientific certainty. For the entire course of human history, men have nursed profound, troubling doubts about the fundamental question of whether or not they were fathers to their own children. Women, by contrast, usually enjoyed a reasonable level of certainty about the matter. Now, a cotton wool swab with a bit of saliva plus a small fee can settle the matter. At a stroke, the one thing that women had going with them has been taken away. The one respect in which they had the last laugh over their husbands and lovers. You can see how this person's a sociopath. Their husbands and lovers. Last laugh. Does that really sound like the basis to have a long-lasting, functional, stable relationship? DNA tests are an anti-feminist appliance of science. Yeah. Because they take away a woman's ability to cuck a man. The subject has resurfaced lately because a married television presenter for who years had been paying for the support of a child conceived, as he thought, as a result of his relationship with a writer. It seems that after meeting the child for the first time, he asked for a DNA test. It duly turned out that he was not, after all, the father. Poor child. Poor child. Yeah, you know what? It is. That, that's true. Poor child. But also poor father. Or rather, poor fooled father. The children are the victim here. But they're not the victim of society. They're not the victim of the DNA test. They're the victim of their shitty mothers. The next Bridget Jones movie may turn this under-discussed issue into a talking point. BJ becomes pregnant, but she is not entirely sure by whom, having been seeing the nice Colin Firth boyfriend and the bad Hugh Grant one in pretty short order. The matter could have been fruitfully ambiguous with Bridget having a choice of fathers. No, 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 no. Are you actually saying that it's better if women can just choose the father of their baby? This is ridiculous. This is insanity. And apparently it's a sordid contemporary fashion for, for them to get a DNA test. And so she found out the paternity of the baby in the most ancient game of humankind. Guess the daddy wasn't played anymore. Yeah, and that is to our benefit? You fucking sociopath? The actor Jude Law recently found himself in just this position and unhesitatingly and ungallantly demanded a DNA test. It's, it's ungallant to demand a DNA test. It's, it's gallant to raise a child that's not yours. I mean, I guess on some level it is. Like, if you, if you decide to take on that responsibility willingly, that is a supreme sacrifice. But nobody should be shamed for not wanting to fucking do it. Uncertainty allows mothers to select for their children the father who would be best for them. Because apparently the father's rights, the father's life, the father's feelings, the father's finances just don't matter. What matters is that, as a male, you were selected by the female. And that is now what your life is about, being selected by your betters. In making paternity conditional on a test rather than the say-so of the mother, it has removed from women a powerful instrument of choice. That's because it should have never been your choice to begin with. Anyway, yeah, this, this Melanie McDonough, she seems like a complete fucking piece of work. Let's stay in the UK for a little bit longer. NHS transgender clinic accused of covering up negative impacts of puberty blockers on children by Oxford professor. I've always maintained that if you want to transition, if you want to become a trans person or you want to, you know, do whatever, that's your right, obviously. Obviously it's your right. But you should also be properly informed about the medical risks and to say that, oh, it's no big deal. Snap your fingers, become a woman. Snap your fingers, become a man again. Don't worry about it. But that's, that's not how it works. There are risks and costs involved, and talking about them frankly is not gatekeeping. At some point, I'm going to have to do a video on, on the trans situation, and I think Lilith is going to help me out with it. We've been talking about it. An Oxford University professor has accused the NHS's only specialized clinic for transgender children of suppressing negative results while undertaking experimental treatment on adolescents. This is hideously unethical. 
Suppress negative results as you test on children because you have an ideology you want to push. They've been giving puberty-blocking hormones to children without robust evidence as to the long-term effects. They declared the trial a success, and the clinic has continued to treat over a thousand children with hormones, but Dr. Biggs's research suggests that after a year of treatment, a significant increase was found in patients who had been born female, self-reporting to staff that they deliberately try to hurt or kill the themselves. And this is when you realize that the radical trans activists don't actually care about trans people. They are actually quite anti-trans because they will push the trans acceptance agenda to the point that they have no problem with actual real trans people killing themselves. The normalization of trans status in society is more important than keeping actual trans people alive, according to these idiots. Puberty blockers exacerbated gender dysphoria, yet the study has been used to justify rolling out this drug regime to several hundred children aged under 16. Yeah, maybe you should be waiting till they hit 18. Maybe you should, you should be waiting till they're fucking adults before you do anything this goddamn serious. Let's shift gears a little bit. A belief in meritocracy is not only false, it's bad for you. <laughs> Said by somebody who probably can't fucking compete. Most people don't just think the world should be read meritocratically. They think it is meritocratic. Well, on some level it is. Think about it. If everything was corrupt, if all of our institutions were purely 100% corrupted, everything was just an eternal power struggle between the people at the top and the people at the bottom, why do things work? How come the power is on right now? How come I can record, edit, upload this video and you can watch it halfway across the world? How come you can go to the grocery store and get food? How does the food get from farm to warehouse to store to your kitchen? I'm not saying that there's no corruption. And I'm not saying that psychopaths don't occasionally enter into a system and hideously corrupt and destroy it. That happens a lot. But if you think that our society isn't at least partially meritocratic, then you have to be living in, in some kind of isolated bubble. Meritocracy has become a leading social ideal. Politicians across the ideological spectrum continually return to the theme that the rewards of life, money, power, jobs, university admission, should be distributed according to skill and effort. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it should be. You shouldn't get something for nothing. Although widely held, the belief that merit rather than luck determines success or failure in the world is demonstrably false. This is not least because merit itself is, in large part, the result of luck. Talent and the capacity for determined effort, sometimes called grit, depend a great deal on one's genetic endowments and upbringing. Well, here's the problem with your argument. You know, it is the result of luck, definitely. But do you know what luck is? Luck is effort over time. That's really all it is. Let's say you want to, you know, pl play in sports or something, all right? And from a young age, you, you practice. And you're terrible at the sport of your choice. But you practice. Every day you practice. Every day you practice. You do get better. You get better. You get better. After years, after a decade of practice, you're, you're pretty good at your sport. All right? And then you get lucky. Your one shot comes along. And because you have a decade of experience under your belt, you've at least accumulated enough skill to take a decent chance at that shot. Now, if you didn't practice for that decade and the shot came along, you would instantly blow it. And here's how you can conceptualize it. Every single day that you practiced and you didn't get lucky and, and your shot didn't come along, that was a failure in a sense. It wasn't a failure because you practice, you gain skills, you, you broaden your horizon a little bit. But it was a failure in that you didn't actually accomplish your long-term goal. You had to wait. You had to wait a decade's worth of days where you practice with no results. That's what getting lucky is. Because all of us, every single one of us, every single human being on this planet will at some point get lucky. We will have a chance to do something that we love. We will have a shot. If you have prepared for your shot, if you do the work when nobody else is watching, then when you finally do get lucky, you can take advantage of it. So this person is right in that it is the result of luck. This person is wrong because they don't know what luck is. You'll notice that people who are exceptionally unlucky are also people who are exceptionally lazy. Now, one of those things, the laziness or the luck, didn't cause the other. They're, they're not correlated in that way. But what happened was that when those people had their chances, they had their shots, 
they couldn't rise to the challenge. In addition to being false, a growing body of research in psychology and neuroscience suggests that believing in meritocracy makes people more selfish, less self-critical, and even more prone to acting in discriminatory ways. Meritocracy is not only wrong, it's bad. I can seem more selfish, because if you have earned your success rightfully, you may want to hold on to it. That's understandable. I don't see, self, I don't see less self-critical. Because the most successful people are, are very self-critical. They're constantly reinventing themselves. They're constantly burning away the dead wood that exists inside of themselves. There's no way that they're, self, there's no way that they're less self-critical. As for prone to acting in discriminatory ways, see, this person doesn't really expand that idea in this article. What do you mean by discriminatory ways? Do you mean that they just become racists or sexists? Legitimately, they just view other groups as naturally inferior? That would be a problem. If by discriminatory ways, do they say things like, well, maybe America's black community is doing poorly, not because of racism, but because fathers don't stick around to raise their kids. And those kids grow up with fewer opportunities. Because that's true. It also makes you a racist to say in today's climate. But it is the heart of the problem, at least in, in terms of black America. What this sounds like to me is that meritocracy is not only wrong, it's bad to this person. Because the lines of thinking that lead you to meritocracy also lead you to realize that there are causes for the world's problems other than racism and sexism. Here's something really dumb. Hawaii considers raising legal smoking age to 100 years... <laughs> So you just want to wanna ban smoking in Hawaii then, basically. You can have 100-year-olds show up and smoke, and that's about it. Hawaii already has some of the toughest laws in cigarette sales, but Democrat politician Richard Cregan, who is a doctor, believes more needs to be done to ban the deadliest artifact in human history. To be fair, you know, um, like, I wouldn't want smoking to be banned, but I wouldn't necessarily fight for it too hard if it was. Like, if it was just out of my hands, I wouldn't be like, this is a travesty. Like, smoking's pretty fucking bad. It, it really is the, the drug argument. I can see both sides, right? Like, should poison be legal? Probably not. You would not knowingly ingest radioactive isotopes or some bullshit, right? At the same time, should people be allowed to get high at the expense of their own health? Yeah, probably. And, you know, cigarettes and alcohol provide a very, a very tame sort of high com in comparison to marijuana and in comparison to harder drugs. But it is ultimately a victimless crime, isn't it? The person's choosing to do it to themselves. So I can see both arguments. And because I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't use drugs, and I've never felt any serious push to do any of those things... I personally do not care about this conversation, but this is one of the but but this is one of the times where the arguments are very evenly balanced because on the one hand, you know, there's the arguments against the nanny state. The state of Hawaii has no place telling their citizens whether they can smoke or not. A legal age of 100 is ridiculous because people past 21 are adults in the states. On the other hand, cigarettes are and they produce toxic substances, and we often regulate toxic substances. While I can understand both arguments, if I really had to choose one, I would, I would ultimately fall on the side of letting people do what they like, even if that's completely self-destructive. You know, as long as they're not destroying somebody else on their downward spiral, you know, I, I, I don't really care. Let's end off with something stupid. Cher calls for laws to control men's bodies. They must be circumcised and show papers or penis. Cher. Cher. I'm reasonably sure that over 50% of your body is artificial. You have no place to be talking about whether or not men's bodies are natural. Here, let's read her ridiculous tweets. Republicans believe they've got God-given right to dictate what we do with our bodies. Women must make laws to control men's bodies. No Viagra, Rogaine, or testosterone. How transphobic of you. All men must be circumcised and show papers or penis to prove it. Massage parlors punishable by death. Men must take the pill? What? You mean, like, e estrogen? Do you, I, I don't know exactly what you mean by the pill. Cher, I think you might have gone off the fucking deep end here, lady. Why is Trump always PR man for villains? Why does he kowtow, kiss ass of dictators, child molesters, murderers, wife beaters, anti-Semites, white supremacists, hater of any skin not lily white? Why? He's 
sick with envy. He wants to be a king, but how can he care nothing for Otto Warmby? What? Cher. I think it's time for you to retire. You're like you're going off the deep end in your old age. Anyway, I am out of here. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you very much for watching yesterday's premiere. I am, for the most part, back on track again and doing regular videos. I appreciate your support on Subscribestar because ever since I did the uh, Patreon is dying, you know, Sargon's last laugh video, my Subscribestar support has, has rapidly bumped up. We are about one third of the way on Subscribestar to me being able to comfortably live on this channel and continue to upgrade my equipment. So thank you very much for all of your support. It's quite incredible. If you're interested in this sort of thing, I will be streaming Mass Effect 2 tonight with my girlfriend. We're continuing our playthrough uh, through the entire series. She's never played it before. Doing that on twitch.tv slash gameboomers tonight. And as always, because I am doing the content creation thing full time now, I stream my video games on Twitch every night. I'm a variety streamer, so just drop in whenever you see a game that you like. I don't know if D&D is on this week. Sargon's really, really dragging his butt about it. Let's hope it is. It's been like five fucking weeks. So whether you're catching me on Discord, seeing me on Twitch, or checking out my videos, thank you very much. I love you.